You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Good morning. I wanted to uh, talk just for a brief second about the baptism celebration that's happening tonight. We do these things uh, about every six months, and the reason that we do them is to provide just like a natural way for people to be thinking about this decision, you know, kind of constantly. Paul says that when we're baptized into Christ, we are, we are baptized into his death, and we are raised to walk with him in a newness of life. And so the promise is that we, we look at this event and we identify ourselves with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We get this new life that's promised to us in the kingdom. And so if you've been thinking about that, if that's a decision that you've been weighing, you can just come tonight in something that can get wet or something that it doesn't matter if it can get wet. Just come wearing something. <laughs> we'll wear, definitely wear something. <clears throat> And we'll just have a great night, you know, celebrating. If there's one person that gets baptized or if there's a bunch of people that get baptized, it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful night. And maybe this is a good opportunity for you to come if you're trying to make some connections, get to know a few more people. This would be a great opportunity to meet some new people. So come tonight. I have a great cookout on the lawn, and it'll be a great, great evening. Lindsay and I just had the opportunity to take our girls up to Michigan for the week and we, went, we started out in Traverse City, and then we drove up the old Mission Peninsula and saw the orchards and vineyards up there. It's beautiful. And then we went up the peninsula, to, which is to the west. Somebody told me the correct way to pronounce it after last service. The Leelanau, I think, peninsula. Take Michigan 22 up, uh, across, and then down the coast there, the west coast. And it's just a beautiful drive where you see all these small towns that have really unique cultures. So one of Lindsay and I's favorite things to do is, are, is to visit these small towns uh, in the U.S. That with unique character. They have restaurants, shops, and experiences that are unique to those places. So two of those places in Michigan are South Haven and Grand Haven. Those are two that we absolutely love. I'll talk about South Haven in just a second. But the Lake Michigan coast is full of these uh, kind of cities that are super distinctive, super unique. And one of the things that makes each of them distinctive is their lighthouse. It, all of these cities have these beautiful lighthouses. I brought some pictures uh, of a few here. This one is from Grand Haven, and uh, just really beautiful shot. This is an amazing place to watch a sunset. The next one is it's called Big Red. That's in Holland, Michigan. This one's the only one of the four that I'm going to show you that's not functional anymore. This is South Haven. That's what I'm going to tell you a story about in just a second. And then this next one is the big Sable Point lighthouse, or lighthouse that's in Ludington. And all of these, like I said, three of them are still functional uh, to this day. So as we were walking uh, out on the pier in South Haven, we're like approaching the lighthouse, we're looking up at this thing and noticing if you turn back to, towards the shore, you're like a football field's length away from the shore and you're surrounded on three sides by water and you're like approaching this structure that's just gorgeous, which was designed as a navigational aid to, to ships. It was designed to keep ships safe, to warn ships of dangerous spots in the water and which served as a beacon of hope. And many of these kind of still do lighthouses kind of serve even culturally as a representation of hope. So we're, we're approaching this thing and I'm looking at it and I cannot help but relate it to the teaching for this morning where Jesus tells his disciples, you are salt 
of the earth, you are the light of the world. So we're continuing through our series in Matthew. The series is called The Gospel According to Matthew. And we're breaking it down into four sections. And each of these four sections have a single word that we're using to define that section. The word for the first four weeks was epicenter. And then we're in an 11-week segment right now. The word that we're using is manifesto. A manifesto is a public declaration of policy and aims, especially one issued before an election by a political party or candidate. That's at least the definition that you'll get if you type define manifesto into your Google search bar. But here's what's happening. Jesus has been announcing, going from city to city, announcing the good news that the kingdom of heaven has arrived. He's not just announcing it, he's also demonstrating it. So people who are sick are being healed. People who are in these oppressive states, they're being freed and invited out of that. And so all of these crowds are starting to follow Jesus. They're starting to be really intrigued by what Jesus is doing. And make no mistake about it, the announcement about a new kingdom during that time was absolutely a political statement. Absolutely was a political affront to the kingdom of Rome, which covered the earth. And here Jesus is coming in and saying, no, there's a new kingdom, there's a different kingdom, there's a totally different way of doing this when you live with God as king. And so what Jesus is going to do in the Sermon on the Mount is he's going to lay out, these are the policies and aims of the kingdom of heaven. If you're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, this is how you should live. And all these people are listening. In this particular case, a bunch of people get together on a mountain. Matthew places it on a mountain. Luke says Jesus came down from a mountain and taught people on a plane. That can be a little, not like an airplane, like a, you know, a flat piece of land. Some of you are like, I didn't know there were airplanes back then. So <laughs> this, this is easily kind of explained when you know the geography of the area. There's a picture here of a church that's kind of built in this location. If you, if you look like kind of beyond those trees, you'll see a big open space. Down that way is the Sea of Galilee. And the whole thing is kind of like a, a bowl. This is the Church of the Beatitudes because it's built in the place historically where the Catholic Church has said this is where Jesus delivered this message. So it's this bowl-like area. The Sea of Galilee is here surrounded by mountains. And uh, so Jesus doesn't need a microphone because... This thing is amplified. His voice is amplified. And thousands and thousands of people have gathered to hear this message, which turns out to be extremely provocative. Extremely bold. Extremely radical. Extremely challenging to the religious establishment, yes, but to also all of the people who are listening, including us. Really challenging to us. So Dave started us off last week talking about the Beatitudes, which kind of lay out that the kingdom of God is going to be different from other kingdoms. You might think of it as an upside down kingdom, like the values are inverted in the kingdom. And then Jesus moves directly on to this text that we're studying today, where he says, you are the salt of the earth. You are are the light of the world. Now, these two metaphors are really powerful, but they're also really common. Everybody in this room knows what salt is. Everybody in this room knows what light is. And everybody sitting there that day listening to Jesus knew what salt and light were as well. Now, we could spend hours talking about each one of those. We're not going to do that because, frankly, I don't think uh, most people would care. You can go home and you can dive into this and see, because you can extrapolate these metaphors out, you know, immeasurably to find significance in what Jesus is saying here about salt and light. But we're just going to narrow it down to three specific things that salt and light have in common. We'll move through these kind of quickly. They're distinctive. That's the first thing. Salt and light are distinctive. Jesus says, what good is salt if it loses its saltiness, its distinctiveness? What good is light if you put it under a bucket and nobody can see it? Like, why would you do that? Because the thing that makes light, you know, light is light. It's distinctiveness. So it is distinctive. Salt and light are also indispensable. 
indispensable. They are of the essence of the world. They're actually vital to a way of living. So people in the first century, when they're listening to Jesus, they would have understood salt in a number of ways, primarily as a preservative, something that prevents things from decaying. They would also have understood it as something that gives flavor, just like we do, something that's used to make fertilizer. They would have understood it as something that was necessary for ritual cleansing and purity. In other words, super important to every, everyday life. Okay, like salt was absolutely necessary to everyday life. And of course, you know, light's the same thing. And we get that, right? If you've ever been in a place that has complete and utter darkness, you know that light is absolutely necessary, right? So for the ships that are out on Lake Michigan trying to navigate, you know, the shoreline, it's really important to have these lighthouses up the coast. These things are indispensable to the safety of ships. They've prevented so many shipwrecks from happening over the years, right? They're indispensable. And then the third thing is that salt and light are transformative. Means they alter the environment that they're in. When we were in elementary school, we used to sit at restaurants and unscrew the caps of salt shakers. Do you guys ever do this? So that the next person that got them and, you know, tried to put salt on their food, the whole thing would just bust open and salt would just pour out over their food. And I'm the only one, really, because the first service had like 78 people that had done that. (laughs) Okay, so it's a terrible thing to do. I mean, it's so rude because these people are paying for food and now you just like dump salt over it. And you can't just remove salt, right? Because salt does the job of transforming its environment. When you put salt on something, it totally changes it. Light's the same way. If you've ever walked into a dark room and flipped on a light, which all of us have, you'll see that light totally transforms and alters the environment. If you've ever shown a flashlight ahead of you in your backyard when it's really dark, you'll see it totally alters it. Maybe if you walk along the you know, sidewalks in your neighborhood and the sidewalks are illuminated with street lights, you'll see. It totally changes everything. So salt and light are distinctive. They are indispensable. They are transformative. There is something that kind of sets these metaphors apart and probably would have set them apart in the minds of the people who were listening. Salt is not really used as a metaphor in Scripture. Light is, like all the time. Light is one of the most frequently used metaphors in Scripture, and it's usually describing goodness. It's usually describing God himself. In fact, Jesus at one point says, I am the light of the world. And when we get this picture of the, of the city of God, when it ultimately comes down and we get to be a part of that, the imagery is that there's no need anymore for a sun or moon because God himself is the light. But what Jesus is saying to his disciples here, which would have been a little shocking to their ears, is that you are the light of the world. You are a city on earth. A hill. Now, one of the things that absolutely would have popped into their minds when they heard city on a hill was Jerusalem. Jerusalem was built on Mount Zion. It was a very important um, city in terms of prophecy. This was the place where the temple was, which means it housed the presence of God. This was the place where um, the Messiah was going to come and begin his you know, new venture of bringing peace to the whole earth. This is where God's chosen people, a royal priesthood, that's the identity that was spoken over them. This is where they live, right? These are the people who had been entrusted with the very words of God. They were, they were designed, Israel was designed to be the model of what it looked like when a group of people lived with God as their king. No human king. What it looked like when a, people, what a group of people lived with God as their king. So Zion, Jerusalem, was the place that was characterized as a city on a hill, a shining beacon of light for the nations. But Jesus isn't telling his disciples that Jerusalem is the city on a hill. He's telling them that they are. How could that be? Because that would have been surprising to their ears. Well, because they are recipients of the kingdom 
of heaven. That they're actually going to model a new way forward for humanity. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. There's a guy by the name of H.N. Ritterboss, who I confess, I don't really know who this person is. He's just a commentator. This quote is cool. He says, this wholesome influence that is exerted by the heirs of the kingdom is not a secondary feature of their lives. It is their essential mark. This influence that's very wholesome, that's it's exerted by salt and light by the heirs of the kingdom, it's not an additional thing. It's not just a secondary feature of their lives. It is their essential mark. So what does it mean? What does it look like for us to be salt and light? Well, sometimes we think of this only in terms of speaking to people about the good news, right? Like telling people about Jesus. That's what it means to be salt and light. But Jesus is actually calling his disciples to something more here. That's certainly, that's certainly a part of it, but there's more here. He actually wants his disciples to embody the good news. Have you ever met someone that embodies the good news, and you just know, like, straight away, and there's something different and distinctive about that person, something that sets that person apart? Well, Lindsay and I were talking about this last night. She uh, recalled when we, the first time we ever saw the show Fixer Upper. Has anybody ever seen that show? A few of you, okay. They fix up houses. Uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines are the people on that show. And the first time that we ever saw it, we had a conversation. Lindsay said, I bet those people are followers of Jesus. And you know, it was not because of anything that they said. It was just, there was something about them that was distinctive. It was different. And, you know, it turns out that, that they are. So when we embody the kingdom, people take notice. Like, it's noticeable. It's distinctive. It is transformative. It absolutely is. Right? So when we embody the kingdom, what happens is we bring renewal to our neighborhoods and our cities. We bring renewal to our neighborhoods and our cities. You say, well, how does, how does that work? How does that happen? Well, let me tell you some ways that people in our own community, people that are sitting here this morning and people who are sitting here in the last service are embodying the good news. We have people in our community that take Jesus' words to love our neighbors quite literally and quite seriously, and they are just good neighbors in every sense of the phrase. We have people in our community that invite foster children into their home others that serve foster families, people who fight for the rights of vulnerable children, and others who have given orphans permanent homes. We have people in our community that work every day to combat the heroin heroin crisis, which is um, massive in scale in Ohio and throughout the United States. Those who run clinics for people who are chemically dependent, and others who are walking with a friend through a chemical dependency or substance abuse situation. We have people who are educating children and young adults, teachers and administrators that serve in our local school systems, bus drivers that love children, parents that serve in the PTO and go on field trips, people who are mentors through coaching and leading clubs. We have people in businesses that treat their customers fair, that model ethical business practices, and business owners who employ people and treat them like family. We have people who invent new products that make the world safer, make the world more convenient, make the world more enjoyable. Scientists trying to find a cure for cancer. We have people who are passionate about announcing the good news to those in the Muslim faith. Women who go into strip clubs to speak value and identity to the women there. Others who have taken steps to eradicate human trafficking. Others who have served and loved girls that have been rescued from human trafficking. We have counselors that walk with people through some of the hardest stuff on the planet. Therapists that help people heal from deep wounds. Friends who love their people through an affair or out of a pornography addiction. There's a base community that is hosting a golf tournament to raise funds so that we can expand our Food to Go program uh, for children who have reduced price lunches at school. And it sends food home on the weekends to those children. We have base communities that are taking walks through their neighborhoods to pray for their cities, pray for their neighbors. We have a base community that just threw an end-of-school party for one of their neighborhoods. People who serve the second 
Friday of every month by cooking and serving a free meal for anyone that needs it in Waynesville. Students who serve on the third Tuesday each month at a mobile food pantry and block party for a neighborhood in Centerville. We have people that serve as nurses, EMTs, uh, and doctors that care for people's physical bodies and walk with people through just really difficult situations. We have dispatchers, firefighters, and police officers who step up in times of need to keep our city safe. We have people who are pursuing training and degrees to raise up the next generation of ministry leaders, people who write books, people that play great music, people that create beautiful art, and people that capture inspiring photographs. And that's just a very small sample. Right? The list goes on and on and on, because Jesus has his people in every sector of society, even in the darkest corners of the earth, to bring light to be agents of renewal. But being salt and light is also played out in the decisions that we make every morning when we wake up. As we go through our day and encounter the people that we encounter every single day, and we have opportunities, and we take those opportunities, we choose to act. Like, as we pay attention to people, this is rare in our culture. So we pay attention to people. We look them in the eye, ask them how they're doing, and then lean in and wait for them to actually answer the question. Like that's kind of a rare thing in society. As we pay for someone's meal when they're behind us in the drive through as we reach out to the person that we heard is going through a pretty rough time right now, as we speak encouraging, life-giving words to the people that are around us every single day, as we go out of our way, you know, go the extra mile just to love somebody in some special way, right? We can make a list that's miles and miles long of what these things look like because the kingdom is modeled minute by minute, hour by hour as we embody it. Now, some of you might say, you know, Kevin, it sounds like you're really emphasizing good works. And I'm not. I'm not. Jesus is. Jesus says, don't be afraid for your good works to be visible. They should be visible. That's what Jesus says. I don't know why, but um, we've kind of given good works kind of a bad name in Christianity. Like, well, don't, let's not talk about good works because good works don't get you in heaven, right? Well, of course they don't. You don't get into the kingdom by doing good works. You don't earn your way in. They're not, you know, to show off or to prove how virtuous we are. Jesus says you do good works so that people will see them and elevate the name of God in the world. Because they associate you, because you wear the name of Christ. They associate Christ with these great things. Andy Stanley uh, talked about this in a message that we heard at a Catalyst conference a while back. And one of the things that he said was, uh, love your city, be as difficult as possible to hate. <laughs> Just do it. Just be, make it as hard for people to hate you as, as possible. The church should be visible, seen doing so much good that they can't wait for us to show up. That's what the church should be in our communities. That's who we should be in our communities. And when we live this way, what happens is that people are drawn to Jesus. This isn't a sales pitch. We're not trying to make God look good. God is good. And so when his people, when people that, that love him, do these things in his name, what it does is it reflects who he is. Wouldn't it be a shame if Christians lived in, in such a way that they gave a false impression of who God is? That would be a shame, right? But what if we lived in such a way that we gave a beautiful name to who God is, that we gave an accurate representation of the character and nature of the goodness of God? That's what we get the opportunity to do every single day as we live as salt and light. That's something that happens organically as we, as we deepen in our belief in Jesus' kingship, as we come to see ourselves more and more primarily as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, as we are guided more and more by the policies and aims of his kingdom. 
will become distinctive, will become indispensable, will become transformative. Let's think about our last three days, okay? What did you do the last three days? What were you thinking while you were doing it? Who did you encounter over the last three days, and how did you treat them? Like, what was your motive behind why you treated them the way that you did? This was Lindsay's idea to ask that question, and uh, so I had to think about it (laughs) before I asked. And I didn't do that very well the last three days. I did not, I did not have in mind, like, I'm going to be salt of the earth and light of the world and, and what I do and how I interact with people. Over the last three days, I just did not do that well. You know what the good news is? I got three more days coming up. Right? So let's think about the next three days. What are we going to do over the next three days? What are you going to do? Who are the people that you're going to come into contact with? How can you be creative with, you know, coming up with ways to surprise people with the goodness of God, with salt and light. Whatever we do, let's do it with excitement, because this is a really fun way to live. It's like, it's a privilege to get to live this way. It's not a burden. So be creative as you want. Just bless people in the name of Jesus. Pour out goodness in the name of Jesus. Be generous in the name of Jesus. One final thing. This teaching reminds us that as followers of Jesus, we should be distinctive, but not distant. The church doesn't always get this right. We should be distinctive, but not distant. Because to live as Jesus did means that we don't shy away from uh, going to hard places, from doing difficult things, from doing important, meaningful work. Jesus was certainly distinctive. That's why thousands and thousands of people are listening to him. He gains crowds wherever he goes. If I tried to give a speech out here on the front lawn, six people would come. And five would be family. You know? Jesus has thousands of people who are coming to see him who are really interested in listening to him because he's distinctive, but he's not different or distant. Distinctive. He's not distant. In fact, What Jesus did was he looked at the messiness of the world, he looked at the brokenness and the pain, and he immersed himself in it. And then ultimately modeled, you know, what it means to to live out the kingdom through the cross and through his resurrection. And so we're reminded of this each week when we take communion together. We look at the cross and we see this modeled in like a breathtaking way. So over the next few minutes, what we're going to do is we're going to take some time, consider the weight that Jesus, uh, of what Jesus has accomplished here through his death and resurrection so that you and I could be reconciled with God. And as we take the bread and the juice, let's remind ourselves again that this type of devotion demonstrated by Jesus, this kind of sacrifice, this kind of love for people is what we're called to. And it's a beautiful thing.